there's a specific kind of body, and it's very much a Kim Kardashian body. And they look the same. I interviewed Nicki Minaj, Cardi B, very small waist, big butt. They're so curvy. They don't look as good in real life. I've got Vanessa Gregoriadis on the show today yet again, and we're going to be talking today about something really weird that is happening with all sorts of celebrities. In the whole celebrity world, they're a different world. It's a different planet. Vanessa, what is it that's going on? Okay. Hello, Andrew. It is so nice to be with you again. Love being on your show. Um, Have you noticed that a lot of celebrities have gotten very skinny recently? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, Am I the well, only I one who's noticed this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they are all quite slim. Some of them, I guess they were always quite slim compared to the average population. That's true. But you know there's this filter that you can use on Instagram or TikTok or whatever that makes you just like gorgeous and makes you look like one of the, you know, Bella Hadid or her sister. They're all starting to look like that in actual real life. Like if you look at a picture of Jessica Simpson, who, you know, has been around since the 2000s, right, and has always been like, you know, not heavy. I mean, none of these people are really heavy, but like a little heavy, um, a little Zaftig. She is now looks like like a supermodel with one of those filters on her faces. Like she's got very defined cheekbones. Her eyes are popping out. And, you know, she and many of these other celebrities are on the cover of all the tabloid magazines that you get in supermarkets. And it's like willpower, my diet. I can't tell you how hard it was. It's crazy that I was able to be such a strong person to lose all this weight. Because as you know, in our society, being thin is, you know, correlated with being virtuous, right? Mm. Yeah, it's weird that that was, because it did feel like it went the other way for a bit of time. It Mm -hmm. was like the, you want to be a bit of a curvier figure. Right. And and that's what Kim Kardashian was known for, wasn't it, I think? But then yes. I, I'm, I'm right. Am I right that she's also on, on the pills now? Kim Kardashian. Okay, well, we, you know, we don't know for sure. <laughs> but Kim Kardashian, who, you know, is is curvy and gorgeous, by the way, but, mm. you know, has been fairly open about how she wanted to use a surrogate for several of her children because, you know, she had some sort of medical issues. One might think that also maybe she wanted to keep her body in better shape is suddenly now much thinner. I mean, she's back to looking the way she used to look back when she had her sex tape, right? She's yes. real thin and she's got to be 40, right? She's 40 at least. Um, she's mom of many children, um, some of which she had herself, some of which she ha- she didn't. And she's basically doing bikini shots that make her look like her younger sister, Kylie, who at one point was like the heir to the throne, you know, was like, whoa, Kim is starting to not look so great. Here comes Kylie in the neon bikini. But now Kim can stay queen because suddenly she has dropped many, many stones, as you all like to say. Yes, Although I don't know if we use it plural like that. It might be many stone. <laughs> okay. Many stone. Lost, lost yes. five stone or whatever. Yeah. Yes, five stone. Okay, yeah, that's that's what it is. I don't have a number on her, but she's gone down like uh, 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 at least, I would say, four to five dress sizes. Um, wow. The kind of loss that just doesn't happen to a woman in her 40s. That's, that, I mean, that you that just does that does not happen right but with this new class of weight loss drugs coming on the market um at least they're sort of uh you know i can't say that they're totally authorized for weight loss they are diabetes drugs but celebrities seem to have gotten their hands on them and boom people like kim kardashian are now the same size at 22 as though they're they look like they're 22 again it's like a time machine mm, not to mention um a certain Meghan markle who um yeah. I'm, I'm looking at articles now is, <laughs> is renowned for having lost post-pregnancy weight loss um, there you go very very fast after two babies <laughs> I mean, one does have to say that Meghan Markle, you know, whatever else you can say from her, that's a disciplined person. So she may she may have just been like, I'm going to grip my teeth. You know, I got to be princess. I got the world to believe that being princess sucked. And now I'm going to lose this weight. (laughs) 
Man, it's a, it's a it's a weird thing, isn't it? Do you worry that there's we already had sort of an underclass and the privileged celebrity class, and with the availability of these kinds of drugs, because they already had insane levels of access to uh, working out, to the gyms, to personal trainers, uh, time to to get looking good while the rest of us are looking after kids and going to work and stressing out. You know, they, they the way that they almost show off sometimes, especially some of the men, I think, or maybe the women, mm-hmm. and men, but some of the men in the film, Christian Bale, I'm thinking of, you know, a new movie, look, I'm overweight and now I've, I'm a, a skeleton. Right. Look how easy it is for me while you guys suffer every day just trying to not eat too much chocolate or whatever. But the, yeah. Are the drugs creating an even more us versus mm. them reality? I think they are. I mean, also remember, there's a lot of influencers on these drugs as well. So I think we're going to a society where celebrities, influencers, people who are in the public eye and and able to make money, you know, doing that to really actually support themselves, because a lot of the economy is going to be destroyed by AI, right? A lot of that white collar economy. Those people are the overclass, like, and they want to look like they're the overclass. And in our society, that means being really, really skinny. It's just correlated with wealth, with success, with, um, you know, just the chicness, fabulousness, glamour, uh, the fashion world. Like, it's just I think that we've never as a society been um, more focused on appearance, right? Attractiveness. Like, uh, you know, think about the way people used to live before there were mirrors. I mean, everybody was just like, fuck, I don't, I mean, I don't even know what I look like, right? <laughs> so it's like, okay, right? And then you had mirrors and then you had, uh, you know, early photographs and video and blah, 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 blah. There's so many historians who have documented all of this, the changes that have gone on and grooming. And now with injection, an injection of Botox, an injection of filler, an injection of Ozempic or one Ozempic-like drug that keeps you skinny. I mean, that's part of of just the daily life of a lot of celebrities. Like, this is what they're doing. You know, they get their vitamin injections. Um, You know, a lot of women are taking hormone replacement therapy now, which, you know, scientists are starting to say is actually good for women in their 40s, 50s, and 60s. It was long thought that that would be something that could create breast cancers and blah, blah, blah. And they're saying, no, it's actually really protective against osteoporosis or dementia, you know, which women sometimes get a lot in their later life. And um, there's reasons to do it. And that also makes you look a lot younger, you know, but all of these things are not they're available to the common person if you have the right doctor who's like, sure, let me put you on hormone replacement therapy. Not every GP is going to do that. You know, you can't get a prescription for Ozempic from your doctor unless you're, you know, obese, I think, or you have diabetes, right? And obesity is actually, like, not such a high bar to cross in terms of, like, you don't have to be, like, you know, a huge person to be considered obese. Like, the body mass index is really messed up, right? So that could happen, but much more often people are buying it through telemedicine, um, purveyors and they're spending like seven hundred and fifty dollars to buy it from Canadian pharmacy number one and Canadian pharmacy number two to have it shipped to Hollywood. Um, that's seven hundred fifty dollars like a month. But when you live in a way that you know your appearance is what you make your living off of, maybe that doesn't seem like a lot of money, right? To lose, yeah. people are losing 50 pounds in the course of six months on this thing. It's insane. You know? it, it annoys me though, for several reasons. I, I'm reading as well online, obviously different sources and different things, but mm-hmm. some people are saying 1200 to $1,500 a month, about a thousand pounds. Okay, thousand, yeah. So even more, but again, if you're one of these celebrities, that's nothing, it's a small change for them. Um, and so the, the thing is, it is a bit weird Okay, let's get we'll get onto the 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 weight loss ones, but the sort of keeping young ones. There there has to come a point where 
even if it looked perfect, it would be a bit weird to see somebody who genuinely looked 20. That's if it worked perfectly, which obviously it doesn't. But she looks like a man or a woman who looked 20. And you say, oh, how old are you? Well, I'm 97. That would be weird. <laughs> you know? That would be but weird. I suppose if it's that per- And then they just like drop dead. And you're like, are you okay, sir? Like, what's happened to you? And you're like, well, I'm like, yeah, he was 97. He's had a heart attack. It's the, looks, picture, like, like it's the picture of Dorian Gray, yeah. right? It's like, yeah. I mean, that's true. But look at Brad Pitt. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, if you go, there's websites out there that will show you pictures of Brad Pitt as a middle-aged man last year, you know, with jowls, right? Yeah. Which everybody gets. He's still very handsome. And now there's pictures of him this year. And he suddenly has no more jowls. Mm. You Tom know? Cruise is another one, isn't he? He's Tom in Cruise. his 60s. Although, yeah. it does feel like we don't know to what extent it was like the movies with the CGI and stuff, where he looks like That's this true. sort of young, weird guy, a bit like when they did it with Robert De Niro and then mm-hmm. Al Pacino. And he looks sort of okay. And then you see him turn up, and he turned up at a Scientology um, conference a few days ago. It was the first Scientology conference that they'd held in four oh, years. Like a public yeah. So he turned up, and he's around in, in London as well, shaking everyone's mm-hmm. hands and doing the whole Tom Cruise thing. And he does suddenly look like whatever he'd had on his face for the last few years had sort of burst. And the real him had come <laughs> out. He's trying to keep it all inside. And it's all, you know, it's all sad and crazy. But the, the weight loss thing, so what's actually going on? Because what I've been reading as well, I, I imagine it's just pills and stuff, but I've seen mm-hmm. talk of a pen. There's some sort of pen. No, no, no. It's an injection for the most part. It's an injection once a week. And they've just come out with some pills. But before then, it's a company out of Denmark, I believe, called Novo Nord. Nordisk, which we all should have bought stock in two years ago, because <laughs> they're apparently their um, their earnings this year were higher than like the GDP of Denmark. <laughs> so wow. I might be making that up. It might be in Norway, but it's up there. But it, you know, they essentially are are they've sort of cornered the market on this thing, and uh, you know, it seems like. Uh, it's it's a you know you shoot it in your leg and then you feel terrible right you end up feeling extremely nauseous um it's very hard to eat food that's not good for you which is interesting like you can't eat a hamburger you can't eat a grilled cheese yogurt tastes good like just anything that's like very very bland like some bone broth but anything that is oily and greasy and heavy your body will like revolt against it and people feel so ill they're confined to bed for like two or three weeks and then your body gets used to it and there's different levels that you can you know i mean it's a long shot right like it's a thing it's not just like it's like a thing that you're putting in your body and do you want to have twice as much because you could lose twice as much weight if you so people really are you know going way high with the dosage um Mm. but no the whole thing is is then as soon as you go off it you'll gain all the weight back so you just have it the rest of your life so it's a bit of a devil's bargain yeah you just don't you don't know I guess you could, unless there are long-term ramifications, which I suppose nobody can yet know, these people can just be on it forever. It's a sad thing, though, because I got overweight. And you're right, the BMI thing is insane because I actually was very close to obese. Like, mm-hmm. I wasn't just, I was like, I didn't even think I was overweight. And I did the BMI yeah. and I'm obese. And I know everybody just said, oh, well, the BMI is ridiculous. And I right. did that as well. But it was still like a bit of a wake-up call. And anybody who's who's interested in that can just go back and look at anything I did a year ago or a year and a half ago, probably my last interview with Vanessa, actually, probably mm-hmm. somewhere. And it's ins- I'm like this, I'm much bigger. But- Are you on Ozempic now? Is that <laughs> what this is all about? Are you going to come out with your secret? When you mentioned um, <laughs> when you mentioned that influencers were on it, I thought, God, are people going to think I'm on it? I don't know. Um, I couldn't afford that, all right? And I wouldn't yeah. want to do it. But what a, what a lovely feeling it was, though. Part of it was because I got into a bit of a rut. Like, I was happy in many ways. I wasn't, like, depressed or anything, but I was, I, you know, when you get into that sort of lazy rut, I, I was just sure. like, on the computer all the time doing all my podcast stuff, obsessing with that, right. just yeah. sitting there and lying there. So what a what an amazing thing for me. I got into tennis and I I'd yeah. never considered tennis before. I got lessons and started playing tennis. And I feel so good that I got to do that. I never would have played tennis. but And there must be so many people around the world, or people listening or watching who have done similar things. Oh, I never would have played squash or started running and now they do marathons. Mm-hmm. This is going to be made, I presume, eventually available to the wider public. And I don't know if that's a good thing because I think we need to sometimes have that discipline. 
Well, remember, it is available to the wider public if you know the right corners to cut right now. Uh, but like, yes, it's I think that I think that you're right. That's the thing. And that's what sort of drives me crazy about it is, OK, fine. Like you've done this. But one would assume that Mindy Kaling from The Office is 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 taking Ozempic. One would assume that Rebel Wilson, the comedian, is taking Ozempic. And yet none of them will come out and say it. I mean, far be it from Kim Kardashian, right, to say she says, well, I didn't have butt implants and, you know, all the rest, right? She'll, they'll never, none of the Kardashians have owned up to plastic surgery, I don't think, other than Kylie saying she had, you know, this breast augmentation and she felt bad about it because she was very young. And um, then she got pregnant very quickly afterwards. And she was obviously like, this is insane. Why did I do this? Now I have huge breasts, right? I'm pregnant. But when you think about somebody like Kim Kardashian, who's made her name off of, quote unquote, authenticity, Mm -hmm. you know, but for them, there's a you know, a judgment call they have to make because they're trying to get sponsorships all the time. And they don't want, you know, Coca-Cola and Pepsi and all these places looking at them and saying, okay, so this woman is saying she's on an off-brand diabetes drug to lose weight. So I think that's why they're not admitting it. But it's like, it seems to me to be a hypocrisy, like a gross hypocrisy to not only not admit you're taking these drugs, but then try to tell, like, you know, Americans and particularly women who we know have a lot of body issues that you just got so skinny (laughs) off of willpower because, like, the normal consumer is looking at this and thinking, well, God, I mean, I guess I just have to go on another diet and shoveling money to, like, Weight Watchers, you know, and all these places that we know these diets don't work, right? Right. We know that. Scientists have shown that. I'm sure you have read all that data. No, I haven't. That, Is that you know, right? The diets don't really work? Diets don't work. The people just, they everybody always gains back weight. The only way to do it is baby steps with exercise, right? Something like, a, you know, a Mediterranean diet where you're really not actually uh, you know, punishing yourself in the way that something that's super low carb is just too, it's just too hard to keep up over time, you know, and people always go back to the mean. And some people's bodies are supposed to be a little, I'm a little heavy, you know, I'm a little, I was always, I mean, when I look at my pictures of myself as a kid, like, I was not a skinny kid, <laughs> you know, and, um, in my 20s, I was pretty thin, but that was also because I was, like, going out all the time. <laughs> I'm not doing that anymore, you know? You go you out look, dancing you all the young, time. Though. You look young. Are you on, I do are you look on young. any of those, those hormones? <laughs> I'm not on the hormone things. But I do. That's my ace in the hole. I mean, that's always been... I mean, I'm, you know, Mediterranean, and I just have this dark skin. But the as a reporter, you and I both, you know, know that we do these jobs where we try to get the confidence of people we're working with. And I don't know. I've kept this young persona sort of is how I present myself when I report as well. So it's it just worked for me. Maybe it's like a body soul connection. I don't know. I'm into it. Though. I saw I saw your your age yesterday yeah. on online. It just I, know, I, it's I like... just put age, and I thought they must have made a mistake. I was I was. I gotta lost. get that taken down. I've been thinking about getting that taken down. I know. I mean, I I had somebody left a nasty comment um, for me about how I was, you know, speaking like a valley girl, which I do a little bit, and that somebody who was nearly 40 years old should not be speaking like this. And I was like, well, thank you. (laughs) I I do appreciate that. Um, As I am very much over 40. So, but uh, yeah, I I just think, you know, I... um, come from the world like you do where celebrities are not to be stand you know and i know in a tyler taylor swift universe you um, should explain stands just for those who don't know that stand word. like just you know love to like uh, protected just like mm. i'm not sure where that comes from do you know where it comes from standing yeah, yeah what is M&M. it oh of course yeah it's the m right. song stand right right yeah. um yeah where he goes and kills Eminem's girlfriend no for him? it's his it's his own girlfriend but he the first three or four verses are okay. 
it's the other guy talking and right. he's not being nice to his own girlfriend, but he's saying that him and Eminem are like soulmates and they need to meet. And Eminem only realizes after he's already killed himself and the and the girlfriend. Um, sure. And he's like, oh God, that was you. I heard about you in the news. Um, right, right, a great, right, a great right, song. right. And how fantastic for something like that to. And, and then there's, there's, <laughs> like, yeah. No, but to write a song like that, <laughs> amazing. Right, right, right. And then yeah. there's like. Um, uh, the King of Comedy was this Scorsese film about that kind of obsession over um, right. celebrities. And then there was The Joker just a year or two ago, which was a similar kind of film. And, yeah, right. that, it's like these happen. parasocial relationships that people mm-hmm. have with celebrities where they believe yeah. these these are my actual friends. I just so do not come from that world. Like, I believe that we live in this feudal society where hmm. there are some people who are the elites and they're at the top and we're all the peasants and we get to throw tomatoes at them if we want. <laughs> Because, like, they got everything. They got the the riches and the looks and the houses and the price. There is a price. And the price is people get to say whatever they want about you in the public square. And the yeah. fact that we have to, like, now live in some world where I can't talk smack about Kim Kardashian or Meghan Markle is so bananas to me like that this somehow boomerangs on me as like you're an ugly person and I'm like I'm just I'm a I'm a cultural critic and analyst and interviewer you know I've spent three days with Kim Kardashian like I know who this person is and my job my actual job that people pay me money to do you know Rolling Stone paid me money to go spend three days with her and tell people what I thought she was like. And what, what was she that's like? not going to, you know, line up with everybody's take. OK, well, she's she's great because, you know, that's the thing about Kareem Kardashian that everybody says, which is she is 100 percent smarter, nicer, more organized, more efficient than you expect, right? And she has been open about this. She said, like, since this sex tape, I made it my mission in life to not be the girl with the sex tape. And each person I meet, all I want them to think is this this girl's, like, normal and nice. Like, she was really messed up by this. Now, I'm not saying she didn't put it out herself, you know? Like, she may have put it out herself, Or with Chris. Or something happened, right? We all know something happened. Joe Francis from Girls Gone Wild was in there. There was stuff going on and schemes. But she, you know, what's made that family work is the fact that Kim is a person who, you know, dabs her her mouth with a napkin, like, when she's eating lunch. Like, she's really oddly... Prim, she definitely has this very sexual persona that she almost thinks of as a different person to her, but she's proper and prim and and warm, right? And dutiful. She's like a dutiful Marilyn Monroe. And part of what's made that family so successful is the fact that she's not a hot mess, right? Like, if she was a Lindsay Lohan-esque you know, DUI, going to prison, drugs kind of thing, this was not this was not gonna work. It's only like the nose to the grindstoneness of her and Chris that has made that family work. But um I mean I will say she, you know, at the time she was married to Kanye and Kanye did not want her to do the interview because he didn't want her to be on the cover of Rolling Stone. And I will never forget this because it was so bananas. And it was like, why? Like, you know, oh, they're going to make fun of you. I don't like this writer. What did they want with you? Blah, blah, blah. And it was like very clearly, this is my terrain. This is my thing. You know, he was shot by David LaChapelle as Jesus for the cover of Rolling Stone famously with a, you know, crown of thorns. And, you know, I I felt like very uh, satisfied that she went ahead and did the interview anyway. And she was like, I, I can handle this. You know, like, I think I'll be OK, Kanye. I think I can handle myself in a little interview with Rolling Stone. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I don't know. It's not the most scintillating, like, backstory. I can tell you that she's just, like, seems to be sort of a nice person. But, uh, 
I I do think that you know she's she's I do think she's taking Ozempic right now, and I think she's <laughs> very very smart about her PR, and I think she. You know, she wants to stay in the mix and she wants to stay in the spotlight on her own terms, like after the whole thing with the th- thievery in Paris that like really did mess her up. She got very, very frightened. Right. So right now, what she and the rest of them, all the Kardashians have is like a lifestyle where they live in these massive houses that double as their professional studios. Right. They're influencer studios and there's whiteboards all over the place saying, you know, today you do your ad for this sponsor and tomorrow we tell everybody that you're dating, you know, whoever, whatever new guy we want to say you're suddenly dating or, you know, whatever it is going to do so we can move the news at the same time that we're d- moving different uh, business opportunities. But um I mean, I would assume those houses are like tax write-offs. I don't know. (laughs) They're professional workplaces. But they're basically like in bunkers. You know, they're in their own like warehouses of themselves and they don't leave except to go to each other's houses. You know, like that. that's that's it. Or like some, you know, whatever, birthday party in Cabo on a private plane with cashmere walls. So... I just think it's a it's a I'm not a huge fan of the Kardashian show, but I think the way that they have run their lives, I mean, you gotta say, it's like a little army and it's like a little printing press of money. Mm. You know? It's a bit grotesque as well. I find it all grotesque and uh almost like aliens playing a role at being human. And by the time she, they've replaced every hormone, I don't know how hormone what a hormone actually is, <laughs> but every hormone's been replaced and every bit of skin's been replaced and mm-hmm. filled with things and the the fat's gone away because they've on these pills. It's they're at a point where they're no longer human. And I think you pointed out before the irony really is that they are praised, not just the Kardashians, but a lot of celebrities for their authentic authenticity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think that you can see, you know, having interviewed a lot of celebrities, um, like there's a specific kind of body and it's very much a Kim Kardashian body, right? But you see over and over I would go and interview people and they would look the same. Like it was like, you know, I interviewed Nicki Minaj. I interviewed Cardi B. Um, like the the very, very, very small waist and sort of big, big butt, you know. I mean, all these people are, are very petite, right? They're like 5'2", five, 5'3", five, got the extensions, blah, 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 blah. Got some sort of facial fig, beautiful, beautiful faces, right, that, that have looked like they have been a little augmented in the, you know, Something maybe has been taken out here and the cheeks have been sort of puffed up. But there's a um, – in terms of the bodies, they're so bodacious. They're so curvy that they don't look as good in real life as they do on the internet. And that, I think, is something people comment on about influencers as well, that often when you see them – they they're trying to emphasize these parts of their bodies so that they can get a lot of likes, right? Like the butt fl- influencers or whatever, and that makes it so you know. But but we're going to the whole reason I was talking about the bunkers is like we're going to a reality. I mean, we may be in it already, where what you look like on Zoom, what I look like right now to you, is more important to me. Than hmm. what I look like to people at pickup at my kid's school. What do I care what they think of me? Right? They're not giving me any likes. <laughs> like, it's so weird. But we're going there because at every school in the U.S. now, like the toxic mom, the PTA mom, is now a mom influencer. Right? Like, that's where we're going. The people in our society who think they're most attractive, who think they have the most to say, who have access to capital, are all going to create these personas, right? These branded personas online. Publishers are going to disappear. There's going to be no more New Yorker magazine or any of these, BBC maybe even. It's just going to be like the Mr. Beast channel, (laughs) the Mavluiser channel, and the Andrew Gold channel. And that's it. Oh, yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> that will still be there. Yeah. And I, I, I get annoyed because I think I look better in real life because I'm tall. That was one of my few things I had was being ah, tall. And now yeah. people meet me in real life and go, oh, God, you're tall. They had no idea. I know. I'm that's the thing. That's the thing. It's so crazy about Zoom is that, like, it, it, you get a pretty good sense of what people's faces actually look like. But then you have no sense of what their body is. And you're like, oh, my God, you're so small. You're so big, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's really I guess weird. I think short people are loving this. There's all sorts of things. Like, I know <laughs> there are a few advantages from a physical perspective that I have. And it annoys me that these are gradually becoming redundant. Firstly, being tall because of being online. Mm-hmm. Having hair um, is also because people can get <laughs> that replaced easily. That's and now, true. being in, like, reasonably good shape, well, people are just going to start taking these pills more and more. Yeah. So... Screw you don't have that. anything. Yeah, no, there's nothing. I mean, that's the thing is you got to just give up at some point. You just got to be like, yeah. that's good. I'm good. But yeah, it's super. The the hair is very interesting. Like, it used to be that there were all these guys who were shaving their heads, right? And they said, I'm going to be bald and I don't care. That's the way I'm going to let it go. Now everybody seems to have hair, <laughs> you know? So, I mean, I think that people must be... Doing like the hair. Pl- I have a friend who like went to Bulgaria to get hair plugs because apparently it's much cheaper than here. But it's supposed to be very, very uh, uh, painful. I don't know. Is it Rogan? I have no idea. I mean, you probably know your man. I don't know what they're doing. And I don't understand. There are so many products for hair that I've seen a lot of people have in their bathrooms and things you see in the bath, the bath mm-hmm. around the shower. There's all this like yeah. regain. And like, I don't look, I'm not a scientist. Maybe somebody can help. I know that's going to surprise a lot of people. But, <laughs> you know, I don't believe that hair follicles that have stopped growing hair because you've put a sort of shampoo on there are now going to start growing the hair again. I feel like that can't possibly be a thing. But the right. transplants that they're getting, where they get that hair put in, it works. And look, if you're yeah. a celebrity with loads of money and you're going bald, I think... I thought about this the other day. I don't think I, I quite um, understood how different it is for a man who's bald. I, I've, I've often heard Larry David joking about it. You're sort of almost mm-hmm. a different race and you nod right. at each other in the street. And it's yeah. a dying breed now. It does feel like a dying breed. That's true. I mean, also, you know, it, 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 the incredible thing is I'm sure you've seen those memes where it's like people, you know, 40 years old in 1970 and 40 years old now. Yeah. <laughs> the people from 1970, like, you know, look like the 80 year olds now. Yeah. Um, yeah they, they really do. But that's why I don't know. I mean, I think the thing about the Ozempic is that's so fascinating is is the the sort of overclass thing. But it's also this question of longevity and health. Right. And if you you know, how much is your weight correlated to how long you'll live? Like, is it true that if you take this drug, you know, something like cholesterol, right? Like your doctor starts bothering you, take these things, you know, bring down your cholesterol, blah, blah, blah. This is something you really need to do. Um, You know, is this class of people who are taking these drugs also going to, I mean, I'm going to think they're going to have better cholesterol, right? Because they're eating way better. Are they going to be able to, you know, quote, unquote, put less pressure on their heart, right? Um, uh, So it's not only just this superficial thing. It's also like these people may actually be able to add time to their um, time on Earth, which is, you know, the biggest battle of all. Right. Like time is, you know, it's not having a fancy espresso machine. It's how much time do you have here? So. I think there are these big questions about it around it and also like a place like America where, you know, obesity, as we just said, you can qualify as obese if you're, you know, sort of overweight, but not even really, Um, you know, but we do have also a large obesity issue. And so if this is something that we could get to everyone and it could help their time on Earth, um, do we have a moral obligation to get a generic of it, like, out as quickly as possible. You know, what's this BS on telehealth so it's only, you know, available to the people who want to be all tricky about it? Um, mm. You know, it. what will the, how will the pharmaceutical industry react? How will the government react? Could this actually become a political issue? I think we have so many political issues going on right now. This is too hard to understand for people. But, um you know, you could see 10 years down the line that there's a real call for it uh, 
I mean, think about just the way that you and I, I'm sure, you know, you are younger than me, but like the way we ate as kids, you know, oh, like yeah. what they gave us in the lunchroom. And I mean, yeah. uh, this stuff is changing all the time. So you you could see something where government's saying, my God, this is like we can reduce so much money in healthcare expenses if we just get everybody on this. And then that's the flip side, right? That's the flip question. That's the fat activist question and the question of like, well, does everybody just have to look like Bella Hadid? Like, does everybody have to look like an influencer with a filter on their face? And like they you can see all their cheekbones and everything like uh do we want healthy, to go yeah. to a society? Right. If it's healthier, you can make that argument. And then also you would see, OK, well, now that everybody's skinny, maybe skinny isn't so elite anymore. Maybe it doesn't feel like virtue. Maybe it just feels like whatever. What's cooler is, you know, to be albino or something. I don't know. <laughs> like so they, suddenly being albino is the best. You no, know? That's the best. And then you're, well, there's Michael Jackson was already trying that years right. ago. So with all the, yeah. you know, he was doing that. I think, you know, what's the funny thing about human nature is like what you're describing, I think, sounds like a plus for the whole of society, that it could only be a good thing that the whole world, especially with this obesity uh, problem yeah. that everybody has, um, everyone's taking these pills and everyone's feeling better, looking better, living longer and feeling great. But I bet that most people listening right now and they shouldn't feel ashamed of this I don't think but I bet at the back of their heads they're going yeah but I don't want that because we like meritocracy and I think it's like we like the idea that I had to work to get into this shape and I worked bloody hard and why should other people just get to take a pill I don't want this pill to be a thing so that's the thing with humanity I think with regards to that but I can see also mm -hmm. in a hundred years maybe everyone does just take this pill like vitamins you know you just right. after you lunch your kids your grandparents you everyone you just take these pills you don't even what's obese what's you don't even know what fat is and that's a right. better future than yeah. the one in Wally right 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 yeah and I think the thing is that the mental I mean I can only speak from the perspective of like women in America but the mental uh like the tax that women have on them to feel uh, that they need to be skinny and and how it's it's sort of, you know, those 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 surveys that they do where American women would rather lose five pounds than like have fifty thousand dollars or something like that. You know, these crazy things that people will say, like, I think about my weight all day, like I think about this all the time and um, to say nothing of bulimia and anorexia, you know, these diseases that, I mean, I have friends who are anorexic, um, who in their middle age, and it's one of the saddest things you've ever seen, you know, that you're just like, this is, how can we, how can I help this person? I mean, this person is potentially going to die, right? Like, that's what we're talking about when you're talking about those severe eating disorders that people don't, you know, grow out of as teenagers. So, I think that there's a, a lot of ways in which this could sort of alleviate some of the anxiety and perpetual like sort of just dis disgust. Um, I mean, I was talking to a historian who was saying, well, this is just the female thing. If you actually look through history, like women are always disgusted by their bodies. Like they're always sort of like, you know, if thinking, well, I don't fit the Victorian, you know, now I'm not like Zaftig the way the Victorians were. And, you know, I don't look like Twiggy. Like it's always sort of the same thing. Mm. But in any case, um, I don't know. It's also very, uh, you know, effective for addiction. Like that's the other thing that they're finding these drugs do. They sort of dis, uh, dis like, um, and, and I am not a medical advisor. Do not take this as medical advice. Um, but they, they sort of uh, like disentangle the loop of I feel bad and if I have this glass of wine, I'll feel better, right? If I mm. eat this donut, I'll get this hit of serotonin, dopamine, whatever it is, and I will feel better. I'll feel like I had a treat. I can get through the day. I don't need the joint. I don't need the beer. And so a lot of people who were very heavy drinkers are also using this drug to, to really bring down their drinking substantially. Interesting. Yeah. So again, that's another one where, yeah, people will be thinking, but I control myself as I am. 
You know, why should these people who and right. on the other side, of course, as well, I'm born with the DNA that I am somebody who is more prone to addiction or right. more prone to being overweight. And mm-hmm. so the whole thing is just so complicated. Did you use the word saftig or zaftig? I've never heard that before. Saftig. Juicy. Yeah. The German word for juicy. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know. In New York, we use that from time to time. What does it mean in, in English then? It just means sort of overweight. It means like, a you know, a woman who wears like a sort of like a, a flowing blouse, you know, like a flowing Indian New print York. blouse that's, in the little overweight with long then, hair. Yeah. If, that's it's Yiddish, in New, yeah. if it's New York, it's Yiddish. That's amazing. Exactly. Exactly. I love that I can, I can understand Yiddish now because of Ger- I went and learned German. And now I, I'm like, <laughs> Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Bloody hell. Well, yeah. I mean, the, the whole, yeah, the, it's a it's a terrifying, but it, exciting maybe world ahead of us. Do you think it's a weird know. frontier? It's a weird frontier. Just when you thought that there was nothing new in the world, suddenly they come up with like a diet drug that actually seems like it's not going to kill you and might be okay for you to take. <laughs> wow, I've got a little paragraph in case people are wondering what it mm-hmm. actually is. There's a, par- mm-hmm. a little paragraph here. The drug is as you were saying, an insulin regulator for the pre-diabetic made mm-hmm. by the Danish, it was Danish pharma Danish, uh, sorry. juggernaut, yeah. Nova Nordisk, whose primary side effect, well, that's badly written because it sounds like Nova Nordisk's primary side effect, but the, <laughs> the drug's <laughs> primary side effect is a dramatic is dramatic weight loss. It has saturated the industry in recent months, helping the beautiful and wealthy shed extra pounds in the never-ending Los Angeles pastime of optimizing appearances. Hollywood nutritionist Matt Mahowald tells Variety that's why I'm reading this, that mm-hmm. the chief benefits of the injections are moderating and pulling back insulin secretion and slowing down your stomach from emptying. It promotes satiation from food. I guess, look, as I was saying Satiation, before, yeah. Yeah, we don't know mm-hmm. what the long-term ramifications of this are. People have only been taking it for a year. Well, no, because it was uh, approved for diabetes a long time ago. So I think it's like, uh, not a long time ago, it's a few years uh, I yes, I agree. I saw on sixty minutes Diane Sawyer or somebody like that saying it was um, totally safe, robust, and fabulous. <laughs> I was like, I'm in. But I mean, sixty minutes. You know, they have no pharmaceutical advertising, so they wouldn't be the kind of place that would want to uh, introduce. You know, anyway, I'm, I'm, that's a, a sort of a joke. Um, I think that you can't believe anything in. Uh, our culture when it comes to pharmaceuticals, but um, we may find out, you know, in 20 years that this gives you pancreatic cancer. But (laughs) as of right now, (laughs) people are some, you know, people who are studying it are fairly positive about it. Um, It's it's, look, I I, I think it's it's an interesting thought uh, experiment whether you know what would this do to society what would it do to a lot of people's daily lives who struggle with their weight to longevity to appearances to the influencer culture or celebrity culture whether it ends up uh exploding and and in in 10 years we say oh my god it changed the face of america and that's on the cover of time magazine i think that's really a question i think that it's much more likely to be what you and I talked about at the beginning, which is the elite few have it. It stays sort of under the radar a little bit. It's still really expensive. And Novo Nordisk makes a lot of money. But, you know, there's not as much of a push because just everything with health takes so incredibly long, you know, Um I mean, even look at an Alzheimer's drug. You know, I have somebody in my family who has Alzheimer's, and there's been a new drug that was finally uh, approved, right? In order to get that drug, you have to go, because there are some brain bleeds um, happening with it, very small percentage. You have to go have an MRI every month for the first four months. You know how hard it is for somebody who has Alzheimer's to go have a brain MRI four times? Like, 
You know, like that's not a good way to get this to people, right? Who are just like, just give it to me. <laughs> like, you know, we're, I have Alzheimer's. I mean, I don't know about the brain bleed, but like, give me that drug. Like, so there's so much stuff like that that goes on in the rapacious, like repulsive pharmaceutical industry where there are drugs that can help people and they can't, you can't even get it to these people or they have these onerous conditions on them. So the, the, idea that something like this will just, you know, be at your local bodega is is sort of hard to believe. Um, however, you know, people will crunch the numbers and they'll say there there's a real benefit to the economy. So it may be, it may be a, a continuing conversation. You can listen to my podcast, Infamous. I do have an episode on there um, entitled, Why Are Mindy Kaling and Kim Kardashian So Thin? <laughs> On Infamous, and we talk all about this and try to figure out what's going to happen. It's a great podcast. People should check that out because you've got all that stuff about Nixium as well, which we spoke about last time when you went and actually met Alison Mack and Keith Ranieri, the the cult leaders of of Nixium. So people should definitely yes um, check that out. Um, yeah, and we're doing the Satanic Panic now, the '80s Satanic Panic. We have a interview with the woman who was accused of abusing 60 kids at a daycare in New Jersey, went to prison for five years, totally innocent. Mm, yeah, tell me a little bit about yeah. the Satanic Panic then. What's what's because I'm always hearing about the Satanic Panic. And what do you and know about I, it? Yeah, this is the thing. I'm just like, I, I, well, I'm pretty sure now because I did look it up at some mm-hmm. point. But for a long time, I'm always, it's just a thing that rhymes, isn't it? So it's quite exciting as it is. <laughs> and it's something that happened decades ago. And yeah. people were saying that other people were getting involved in these sort of, I can't use too many of the words because of YouTube, but these sexual, horrible things sure. while worshipping Satan. And it turned out to not be true. But then the whole the social contagion affected the whole country. So basically what happened is, the, you know, the moral majority, the sort of megachurch Republicans who came into power in the 80s and, and Reagan were very interested in promoting, you know, family values. And they needed like an immoral foil. They needed to explain why kids were listening to heavy metal. Why were they playing Dungeons and Dragons? Why were there so many violent films? And, you know, Satan was a good explanation. So Satan and Satanism and the Church of Satan was around. The Satanic Bible was in, you know, the the bookstores um, sort of got um, this all thrown at his feet, all teenage culture, essentially, like heavy metal teenage culture. And you used to... You know, they used, butt right, exactly. They used to say that you could play some of your records backwards and you could hear Satanic sayings because these rock mm. bands, you know, had these things. And... Um, and that just got it melded in because uh, of the issues around family values with these issues of women working, right, which the conservatives didn't want women to work. Suddenly in the 80s, many more women were working than ever before in the U.S., and they needed somebody to take care of these kids. And we have no subsidized daycares here. So there were these new daycares, right, where you no subsidized child care. So... Now, what is a daycare? Oh, it's a place where you have strangers take care of your children. You know, mm. that was already like making people feel pretty scared. That's weird. You're giving a stranger your ch- child, not your sister, just like a stranger and like a warehouse and a church. What is this? And so working women dropped off their kids. And then lo and behold, some of them found out that the daycare providers themselves, the nursery monitors, the teachers, the people who are changing the diapers, were Satanists. <laughs> Which because also, was so not is this the political? <laughs> is this also the yeah. political aspect of what you're saying? They're Satanists in in an indirect way because they are enabling this society whereby women can go to work and leave their kids with the right. Exactly, the they're sort of part of this, you know, this new newfangled society where professional women are able to work and be like self actualized, and then. Uh, Okay, well, who well, who are these people? What are they really about, right? And so this, I mean, it sort of all was just a contagion off of uh, stories about Satanists, you know, killing people or babies on altars or blah, 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 blah. It was like a sort of blood libel idea, right? Like okay. we kill this, killing babies. Um, hmm. So, but it, 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 
when you go back and you listen to the newsreels from the 1980s of Geraldo or Sarah Jess- Sally Jesse Raphael or blah, 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 everybody took this completely seriously. This was 100 percent reported by 2020 and every place else as something that was happening. Like these children had to go to the basement of this daycare and watch the teachers club a horse with a bat. And and everybody believed it was true. And these, you know, they were convicted by juries. I mean, Ugh. dozens and dozens of daycare providers across the country. And it wasn't until the 90s that people went back and they said, oh, wait a second. You're you were interviewing three and four and five year old kids and asking them questions like. What has she done to you? You know what I mean? Like, was there something? Did she did she spread peanut butter on you, you know, mm. and then try to take it off? You know, in my case that I'm writing about with this nice woman who spent five years in prison, she uh, was accused of playing Jingle Bells naked. You know, how would this happen in a daycare? Nobody would see her playing Jingle Bells again. So it's a terrifying, I think the reason that it's brought up so often on YouTube and and other places that talk about conspiracies is that it is such a full-throated conspiracy and and illusion um, that everybody bought into. And it's a great example of a social contagion and how when you're fearful about the thing that you care the most about in life, which is children, your children, right, you'll believe anything and you'll go to any length to protect that child, even if it sounds out of, you know, unbearably yeah. insane. Well, this has oh, very controversial connotations for today's society which mm-hmm. i guess we shouldn't go into too much because everyone's computers will instantly blow up from um hearing slightly controversial things <laughs> but i mean even yeah. i remember reading that um i don't want to oh, i don't want to say the a word for when, when mm-hmm. you have an, when you're eating and, and stuff because too often just because youtube gets mm-hmm. thinks it's like encouraging that yeah uh, but but that with regards to being skinny um, apparently took off as a, a really American thing and had mm-hmm. never, there wasn't even one case of this in Japan. But once American culture went over to Japan, suddenly there were hundreds and hundreds of cases. Mm. Of course, that's a cause and correlation thing. Maybe it was happening and no one knew how to diagnose it. But yeah. a lot of people suggest that it, it wasn't happening right. to the same extent. Interesting. It yeah. So that's one of the examples of social contagion. It, it's just incredible how our brains will just fall in line with, and, and we don't know, I mean, you and I talking to each other right now might have some sort of social contagion that we just have no idea about. That's how it works, doesn't it? Right, absolutely. I mean, we're, we're social animals. We're like human beings, you know, and as soon as the, the you know, the peer group starts believing something in the, these cases, these satanic panic cases, it was really the parents, right, reinforcing what the social workers were asking them, you know. Mm. They would give the kids these anatomical dolls, like these dolls, you know, with actual like uh, real body parts, not like Barbie and Ken. And then, you know, they would do all these perverted things with the dolls because they're children. <laughs> like, yeah. What else do they do? Of course they're going to do that. <laughs> and that would be more evidence. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's. Yeah. I mean, look, I think a lot of people who watch your channel are fascinated by stories where everybody believes one thing to be true and builds a theory around it and circles the wagons, builds the walls up, you know, brick by brick, and then it becomes a fortress. And none of this stuff was true. I mean, I will say it's really interesting, um, you know, as somebody who is not anti-Me Too, who sees problems with Me Too, but is not essentially anti-Me Too, all of the people that I interviewed for Satanic Panic about for this series on Infamous, uh, my podcast, uh, they are, are all think that Me Too was a social contagion. I mean, they all mentioned it to me. But that's a social contagion so, in itself because you've been victim of a social contagion. You start to see everything as a social contagion. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So they're just like, it's just the same. I mean, they're basically like, this. it's another moral panic. We saw the satanic panic. Are you going to draw, you know, draw parallels in your podcast? I'll talk about it a bit. But, you know, it's it's to me, it's it's not necessarily me too. It's all of those kinds of social issues where you just can't see beyond your own 
face, right? Like would you, you just would can't you dare, see further than your hand. You I've read a book about uh, about um, Me Too. I've read a book no. about about uh, sexual assault. So I'm not like afraid I, of the issue. No, but, not that. I, I think um, the, what, what, a lot of the things you said there are parallels with with the gender critical and trans mm-hmm. ideology stuff. You know, especially when you say it's okay. The, no, well, that parents, I don't want to. T- I don't want to touch yeah, that. That's what I'm wondering. Would you be brave enough to <laughs> no, venture no, into those no, murky no. waters? <laughs> I mean, yeah. I don't know. I mean, my it's very difficult. That's a very difficult issue for me because I have a tween daughter in the public school system in Brooklyn, which is where a lot of this stuff is going down, yeah. and I want her to be safe and that's the number one thing that i want and so you know it it, it's really difficult for me it's really about the hormones for me and the choice what at what age should you make these choices for yourself and at what age should your parents make choices and what is healthy experimentation and what is you know, going too far. And I have, nev- I have not been able to really find that line for myself. So I haven't really spoken about it publicly. But I will say that, like, I know a lot of the people who are writing about it on both sides of the issue. And it is the issue locally where I live. Like, it is the issue. And, and you know, the people I know are are writers and editors, whether they're left wingers or you know there aren't that many right wingers left in the mainstream media but like there are some right or at least they have very prominent substacks and i think a lot of it is being colored by the fact that a lot of those people are parents in brooklyn who wear the public schools are you know my 5 year old is like my pronouns are he him hmm. like they're this is in the schools that's not a lie like this is being taught it to our children in our schools, and they're not clear that gender and sex are two different things. They they think it's all sort of like one thing mixed up, and they're mm. not totally sure where they fall. And it's been very strange to watch this debate at the same time, like, I don't want to stifle my child. Do you know what I mean? Like, I want, yeah. I just want everybody to be good and, and happy. Um, and it's a fascinating i think it's a fascinating issue just on an intellectual level but i'm part of a, like a group of people who are really seeing it up close and personal which has been strange because i think in a lot of other parts of america this is like you know this is just abstract right you don't even know people who are talking about this you're not being asked your 5 year old isn't being asked for his pronouns in kindergarten right but in brooklyn it's really happening so anyway, that's my that's my non statement <laughs> on this issue. <laughs> yeah, and then the other half of the yeah. Brooklyn public school system are Hasidic Jews, from what I gather. Well, I don't know about that, but there are quite a few Hasidic it's like Jews a lot. in Brooklyn. It's a lot, and I, I don't mean that in yeah. that. Oh my God, there are Jews everywhere. I'm one myself. Right. I'm Jewish, so I can say what I want. But I, and I'm not talking about secular yeah. Jews. I'm talking about the Hasidic Jews. It's like a huge part of the public Brooklyn. City. It's a crazy thing. Well, well yeah, yeah, yeah. This, I mean, they've got to go yeah. to school. I suppose. That, no, totally. Yeah, I mean that's uh, it's it's you know that in some cases in 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 communities that aren't great, you know, being as a, a person who writes about cults, right? We know that mm-hmm. there's a lot of great Hasidic Jews, and there's some you know of those groups that aren't aren't yeah. aren't so great, and they're not so great for women generally. I don't think, but. No. Yeah, you got, I mean, look, in Brooklyn, Brooklyn is like one of these, it's like London. It's like one of these melting pots where you got just people from all over, you know, we've got like all, you know, Latins and Blacks and and Asian people. And, you know, it's just like everybody's mixed up and a lot of immigrants um, and then a lot of, uh, you know, white people who work for um, fancy publications (laughs) telling people (laughs) what they think. So as they should. As they <laughs> yes, bloody should. That's right. Uh, it's, it's funny. I'm sure when you mentioned that at school, you know, this is happening, the he, the he, him yeah. pronouns and stuff like that. Um, I was just thinking, I just like hear in my head that 50% of people who are watching and listening going, well, and so they should, the he, him. That's exactly right. And 50% going, yeah. what? They do what? I can't believe it. So <laughs> people will have to just agree to disagree to some extent. I, yeah. I, again, I'm not, I'm not against a lot of it. I just think yeah. it's like, it's, it's complicated. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much for having me. Well, 
Yes, uh, go and get Vanessa's podcast, uh, Infamous. Go, I love it. It's the best thing ever. And she's, she, the, the Nixium stuff's there as well. There's loads yes, of really good right. investigations. It's mm-hmm. proper investigations, not just Thank people you. messing about on YouTube like some of us. <laughs> it's real investigations, journalism, and who's not afraid to get into the celebrity stuff as well. So yeah, I love yeah. that. Go check it out, Infamous. Check And, and just look up Vanessa Gregoriadis' uh, articles and things like that. Uh, hit the like on this video and share it with everyone you know. Put it all over mm-hmm. the socials. And keep... Keep watching this channel for more of this interesting stuff.